Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have a topic here that we hope is going to be of interest to all of you and have a pretty strong feeling is not only of interest, but something you are dealing with literally every single day. And that something is what we're calling the new activism. Um, activism itself, of course, is anything but new. It has been around for quite some time. It has taken on a new shape lately, however, and it is a shape that is um, literally changing the way our clients and people like this sitting on this panel uh, need to do business every single day. So that's what we're going to talk about. And what you're going to see here is um, a picture of somebody mm -hmm. that I know many of you know quite well. She is, of course, mostly known as the food babe. And she is affecting the way food companies act, react, and in fact, the products that those companies are selling to consumers. That's a pretty big deal. It is something that we don't take lightly. And in fact, at Golan Harris, we're doing a lot of research on people like her, not in particular to understand her, however, but to understand and, and to help our clients understand how better to deal with and relate to people like her. And that's what this great panel uh, is up here to talk about today. So let me uh, introduce them. I'm delighted that they are all here. <laughs> One of them had very little choice, however. <laughs> um, and that is uh, my colleague Scott Farrell at the end of the panel here, who heads corporate communications for Golan Harris. Sitting next to him is Anne Villamos, who is based in Denmark and is with Danish Crown. Danish Crown is an international food company. As many of you know, it is the leading producer of pork and beef in Europe. Um, and uh, is dealing with, let's say, some sensitive issues, uh, uh, like many of those that we're, we're going to be talking about this afternoon. And Mike Fernandez of Cargill. Uh, Mike heads corporate communications for Cargill, everything from government relations to media relations to brand and everything in between. And Cargill and Mike are based in Minneapolis. So what I'm going to do is get us grounded in this issue a bit and then we're going to open it up for conversation and ideally many of your questions. But what we wanted to do was just to share a little bit of what we have learned and what's been going on of late in this era of new activism and just get some of the wheels moving a little bit about this. Headlines like these are not new, but in fact these three headlines are brand new. They have come up only in the last seven or ten days or so, and it is, again, what we're seeing happening all the time, and so are you, with Kraft announcing the removal of dyes from their mac and cheese. This is just uh, maybe five days ago. Um, Cargill, Mike's company, um, labeling what has become known as pink slime, and the whole phenomenon of that is something absolutely fascinating. Pressure for companies like Mars to remove dyes from their products. Anyway, there could be 10 headlines like these. They are happening literally all the time. So what we're doing, as I mentioned, is looking into this, not only to understand the people that are helping to make this change, and that is what they are, and that's a real important distinction, not organizations, but people, but what are companies doing to better understand this themselves? What is working? What's not working? What are they finding particularly challenging? And we're in the middle of this research right now, talking to food companies literally all over the world, and finding some very interesting points of connection and shared, com uh, shared common themes. And that's what we're going to talk to you about in just a little bit. But first, just a very, very quick review for us all. We don't need to spend much time on this. But where has activism come from? Well, it obviously has evolved considerably, and I'm not sure if anybody, um, all of you would agree that the earliest forms of activism really came from places like Good Housekeeping with the Good house Housekeeping Seal, with, um, with things happening in the formative years with, with CSPI, the Center for Science and the Public Interest, obviously um, really launched activism in an entirely new way, but it didn't stop there, of course. Then we're calling this phase the formalized force, when activism became part of the mainstream, part of 
sort of celebrity life. It took on a very, very different star power in this era than this idea of the mainstream push, real advocacy as part of activism. They weren't always the same thing, but this is when we saw this advocacy rising so dramatically, and to this point today that we're calling citizen action. So we all know what has changed, and uh, it's so obvious that perhaps it doesn't even need to really be mentioned, but it has to be. Because when you combine change.org and care to take part and so on and so forth, with the way people are behaving and sharing and talking in social media, you have an entirely different mindset, a different brigade, and it changes literally everything. So that's where we are. These activists, these real people, are leveraging clearly a varied and very powerful playbook. We all know the tools that they use. The most powerful tool, of course, is emotion. Emotion and a megaphone unlike any activists have ever had before. So who are they? And I mentioned that our job isn't really to dig in mm -hmm. deep to these different kinds of consumer advocates, but it's important for us to sort of look at them and say, what, how can we characterize them? Do they, do they have some common ground? Well, of course they do. Um, but what we've learned and have described here is four specific faces, four groups of consumer activists, and we'll just introduce them very briefly now. So you'll all know this example, and Mike knows it particularly well. Um, this is our favorite face of what we're calling the real food mom. Uh, real food moms are professional women sort of making a career change, if you will. They've been very encouraged by positive feedback, by early success. Many of them begin with one particular issue and then use that as a launching pad for many, many others. Uh, so they are clearly genuine in what they're trying to do, uh, and that, of course, makes a big difference. And the example here is Bettina Siegel, uh, the lunch tray person, who is the first one of, of, of her type to write about pink slime and became famous for doing so. It actually, as Mike will talk about, it was far from the first time that the term was used, but what's interesting was that her activism is what has made such a big change. The second group we're calling professional activists, and these folks are very similar to the real food moms, but perhaps a little more organized themselves. They really are good at this, and they are doing it for a different reason, a, a little bit more of a personal reason. Uh, their activism has already become a profession. So they're focused on an issue, but what's their purpose? They want to write the book. They want to get some specific attention. They want to be on a stage, and not necessarily for ego reasons, but because they think that that's what's going to make them all the more uh, powerful and impactful with what they're doing. A third example uh, is one that I know we've all thought and talked a lot about, and they're the kids. The kid activists, we're calling them empowered kids, and they're powerful and become empowered because of their passion for an issue. So this, of course, is Sarah Kavanaugh, who is really credited, whether Gatorade would acknowledge or not, it or not, changing the recipe for, uh, for Gatorade. Um, these kids, and this is, what's interesting here is that the kids are the group that is a little distinctive in that boys and girls are both really active in this group. The others are primarily women, overwhelmingly women, and that's a fact that I think uh, we should keep in mind in terms of dealing with them. So there are many, many. Um, they are very, very uh, interested in education. They don't just want to take a stand. They want others to understand why they're doing it. Um, and, of course, like many young people, um, feel that it's absolutely the right thing to do, not just to make change, but to be a person who wants to overall advocate for making change, whether, whether it's the specific thing they're working on or not. And the final group is a real interesting one. 
Um, this is a group that we're calling the experienced survivors. So what, who are these people and what makes them different? Well, these are people that have been motivated by a specific act, something that has happened in their lives that has motivated them to make change. So it's usually something quite tragic. Um, there's a death that has occurred, for instance, or a very, very serious illness. So in dealing with this kind of group, obviously, it's quite, quite different and distinctive from some others. And that's what, again, makes this idea of dealing with the new activists so both compelling and challenging. So as we embark on our discussion, which is really about responding to this, what do companies do? How do they grapple with all this? It is really difficult. And as we're learning in our conversations, nobody feels they have this nailed. They are all wondering, struggling a bit, I think it's fair to say. Some have some very interesting ideas about being straightforward, upfront, and others that are being a little bit more um, reticent to, to engage in that way. So we found common themes. These are not findings, these are not recommendations. They're the themes that we're finding in these conversations that we wanted to bring to light for all of you, and we're gonna talk about them in a minute. I'm introducing them just real quickly so that you know what's coming. So the first is this idea of friends or foes. What we're finding in many of our conversations is organizations that were at one time absolutely at odds with companies like Cargill and Danish Crown. Now we're finding a lot more common ground, so that's interesting. And what can we find and do with that common ground? The second theme is a real surprising one, perhaps. Consumer activists act like people. They don't act like organizations. They don't act like companies. They don't act like professionals like Michael ja Jacobson. They act like people. And that makes it harder. But again, very interesting. One size can't fit all. It's, again, related to this point. If these are people, not organizations, they have no track record. They're, they're different than the ones that came before them that you dealt with two weeks ago. So that's a really critical point and, again, makes this challenging. Um, perhaps our favorite, um, the notion that emotion trumps science every single time. And when you're dealing with food and food issues, there's a lot of ick to talk about. And it certainly sticks. Very important principle we're finding that a lot of people are talking about but not necessarily knowing exactly how to navigate is in the midst of all this not to forget the people who are real fans of your products as they exist right now. The people who perhaps can afford your products as they exist right now versus the far more costly version that might be on the shelf if many changes were made. How do you balance that, your current fans, with people that are asking you or pressuring you to make change? And that leads to this final point. Um, pressure versus progress. What's the balance there? What's the relationship between these things? Is, is this activity from the new activists amounting to progress being made? Or in many cases, is it just pressure? And what do you do when you're sitting in these chairs? What do you do about that? So let's start. So friends or foes? So the point here, the little note on the slide, is that companies and NGOs, Mike, are finding mm -hmm. they might have a lot more in common with each other than they realized mm -hmm. in the past. Is that true? And can you do something about it to your advantage in this era of the new activism? And then where does that put the consumer yeah. activists? So first of all, I, th I think you got to approach it slightly differently, and that is to look at the activist as just someone who's come up upon uh, some recognition, some, uh, some notion of mm -hmm. what this product is doing or could do, and try to understand it from their perspective. Uh, in a number of instances, uh, we have reached out to these activists, we've reached out to NGOs, 
uh, with an idea of trying to see if we can get a shared understanding about what ex exactly is changing or what mm -hmm. exactly is taking place. Uh, case in point, uh, when it came to issues dealing with uh, whether or not uh, we were damaging the Amazon as we were buying soy from farmers in the northern tier of Brazil, uh, we ultimately sat down with Greenpeace. We sat down with World Wildlife Fund. Uh, we sat down with NGOs that were in Brazil and came up with a solution uh, that was working for us and working for the farmers and was working for the NGOs. And essentially what we mm -hmm. did is we set up a satellite routine where we were literally monitoring the farms that we were buying the crop from to make sure that they weren't doing anything that was harmful to the environment, tearing down trees, burning, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a win-win-win for all parties. So it wasn't looking at it by saying as your opening was, which was let's, you know, how do you do this to your advantage? Mm -hmm. It's really a whole new thought. What can we do for our collective advantage? So have you found that your interest in engaging in that way mm -hmm. with these NGOs has changed in light of this new consumer activism? Are you sort of more likely to do it, more interested in that kind of engagement? Have you found more in common with them, for instance, than perhaps in the past? Well, well yeah, I think what's happened is, so businesses have come to understand and our customers have come to understand that a sustainable world is good for all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, it, we, we need to be able to uh, continue to grow those crops. And if we do something harmful to the soil or harmful to the land, that's not a good thing mm -hmm. for our long-term viability. Sure. And if you assume, as the accounting principles underlying a business assume, that we're going to be an ongoing concern, uh, Obviously, we're on the same side of the table. The question is, how do you get there? Mm -hmm. And how do you get there is by literally sitting down and having a common understanding of what you're both trying to achieve. That may mean each side has to give a little in order to gain a lot. But I think that that's what's happened for us in terms of uh, dealing with soy in Brazil, mm -hmm. dealing with palm oil in Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, as well as carried on to a whole host of other issues. I mean, you mentioned earlier uh, with uh, Bettina Siegel and the whole story relative to pink slime. And I think, you know, we call that in the industry, we call that lean, finely textured beef. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting is after that, after that hit in the news, uh, and, and it happened almost the way you yeah. suggested, is that there had been lots of different stories and lots of different mentions, but really what drove everything was this woman in Houston, Texas, who had that blog, The Lunch Tray, and she put out a petition because she found out, oh, this is in the school lunch program. And so it created a level of outrage uh, that prompted people to say, oh, gee, you know, this is important, we need to do something about it. The sad part is it wasn't very much based in yeah. science. And so Phil Boffey, who used to be the uh, science editor uh, for the New York Times, actually, after all of this blew over, uh, wrote an editorial for the New York Times that said, what if it weren't called pink slime? Uh, but he closed, I think, with what's important and what I want to share here, and that is, this is his, his last two sentences. As unfair as this episode has been, industry and government should take it as a warning. Americans need to know, and I'd, I'd say everyone, needs to know more about the food they eat and the efforts being taken to ensure that it is safe. Uh, so I think the onus in part is also in us as companies to be activists ourselves. Uh, that is to be uh, more transparent in terms of giving people a glean into, you know, how our products are derived, uh, how they're developed and processed, uh, such that you don't have this cacophony of voices uh, that are forcing bad decisions that are costing consumers actually more money, uh, harming the environment, and putting us in a situation that is 
uh, highly detrimental to the whole economics of this situation. So, Anne, um, thank you, Mike. Another principle that we talked about that, again, we're hearing lots of commonality as we're doing our research is this idea of consumer activists acting like people. So how are you experiencing that at Danish Crown and how are you responding to it? I know one of the things that we've talked about in our conversations is that you've decided to be very direct in your communication with yes. consumers about what you all do for a living. <laughs> yes. And, and I think it's an interesting point, and I'd love for you to tell our, our audience that, but then also to reflect on, is that in a way reflecting this idea of consumer activists are, are people first? I mean, very much so. I mean, we met briefly last night, and um, I made this little sort of joke that as a European, we find it a little funny that in the US you talk about harvesting the animals which I think is a bit of a cover-up because we actually do kill them. Um, and that's what I usually say. I kind of travel a lot with a little talk that's called reputation management when you kill for a living uh, because these two things kind of um, makes for an interesting um, combination. I think when you look at the whole issue of this, like in a, in a total picture, I think the interesting part is when you say that activist acts like people. Well, at the end of the day, especially in the food manufacturing business, we can never afford to say here the, in terms of stakeholders, so these are the activists and these are the customers and these are the consumers. This is all one group. Even if you look into here are the employees right. and here are the owners, they're all going to eat our product. So at the end of the day, we have to treat and communicate to everybody uh, in a sense that we expect them to, at the end of the day, they want to eat our product. I mean, when we opened, which is to this date, the world's most modern store facility, we decided to build it so that we can actually have people come and see it, not just as a mm -hmm. see a meeting room, see a movie, see a whatever. And uh, you can actually go follow the process on our website. So we receive, for Denmark, it's quite a lot, 25,000 guests a year at this store facility, where well, we kill 110,000 picks a week. It's a lot of dead pick. Um, but I brought my nephews, and that's, at that point, they were three, six, and nine and say, oh, they hear the pigs come in. But Andy Ann, why are they having graffiti on their backs? This is the way they mark out on the farms which one are going to die. I mean, if we, if we as companies start by trying to talk about that, talk around that, talk, start by talking about harvesting, I have this sort of comic stripe in my head with this pigs standing out there, and you can just you know, pick it on the, out in the field. Uh, that's harvesting for me. It might be a language thing. But... If we start that way, how would we ever expect at the other end people to respect and understand that unless you want to be a fruitarian, mm -hmm. and I'm sorry, but I can't go there. Uh, I love my shoes too much. Uh, but unless you want to go there, you would have to accept that in order to get the pig, we'll have to kill it. And as I told you yesterday, we would, I had this very young reporter call me, and uh, she was on the verge of activism, but she was actually with the newspaper, and she said, so do you think it's okay you kill the animals? And I'm thinking, funny question to ask a VP in a slaughter facility, right? But I um, thought, let's go with a bit of a sense of humor. And I said, well, off the top of my head, I can, I can see two other options. But we would have to, I think, debate this a bit. One would be for us to eat the animals alive. And now my kitchen is not built for it. I've got white floors. And, it's, and also, where do you start if you want the animal to stop going oink, oink pretty fast? Because I, I wouldn't be able to eat at one end, and the other end, it would still be oinking. It's yeah, too weird. How do you deal with leftovers? And, and even for, I mean, for a foodie like me, 20, well, 82.4 kilograms of pig in like one meal, it's a lot. So does it have to go in the fridge? There's a lot of questions. She was going very quiet and I was having a blast. So, and then I asked her afterwards, the other option would be to turn the entire world into fruitarians, meeting, eating almost rotten fruit, wearing shoes made out of paper. Um, and, and this might offend somebody, uh, that's, my, th that's me, uh, I told you I'm not nice. No. And I said um, to her, I've never met a fruitarian with a sound sense of humor. It's like they're lacking the protein in their food, I don't know. Um, she hung up, the newspaper never hit, but it's a good example of, some of the emotions mm -hmm. that sets up this, because I think what we're all sharing here is that what sets it off is very seldom knowledge. Yes. It's always 
emotions. And what we're producing, what we have in common here is we're producing something that has to do with trust and has to do with, you, you put it in, in the mouth of your family. And if what we're producing is not okay, makes people sick, ruins the environment, yes. it's, it's got all these hassles uh, attached to it. And it's up to us to take the first step. But then we do see the organizations that you were talking about trying to make alliances and the bigger ones in becoming more pragmatic and saying, okay, I'd rather be in there giving a little to make a big change than just be in the opposition of everything. But then we see new organizations coming out that, that haven't got that ground and who will go very far and who are actually not interested, even asked directly, mm -hmm. do you want to make a change? Do you want to make progress? No, I just actually want my 15 minutes of fame. Right. Yeah. 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 And th those are uh, hard to, to struggle with. So uh, as the slides have a mind of their own, which I'm sure is apparent <laughs> to everyone and not just me, um, we'll, I guess, let them just keep doing their, their thing up there. Um, but, Anne, what you're talking about doing, I think, is so interesting. And, and hindsight's 2020. so who knows what might have happened with other changes that we've seen that, that clearly have had a connection to the activists themselves. Yeah. But it, if there was a little bit more of this kind of straight talk from the beginning, I don't know. But I wonder, Scott, if one of our principles of ick sticks, mm -hmm. um, which is a real powerful one and which a lot of activists are using, this idea of kind of getting into it and talking about ingredients and processes in a, in a very um, grand, uh, sort of dramatic way. Um, would the idea of s sort of straight talk diffuse ick sticks, do you think? Would, would, it, would it help? What, what's your thought on that? I don't know if it's a real dilemma because we heard a little bit about that this morning, right, in the presentation about changing minds. Mm -hmm. That if convictions are really firmly held by somebody, um, almost no amount of facts is going right. to move them off center. So the target then has to be not the activist. You sort of have to separate yeah. the messenger from the message and you know, sort of look at that movable middle, right? Who are the people that still are gonna be open to finding that message? You need to segment your audience in a way that says there's this group of folks who are gonna align so closely with Bettina that right. there's no way we're gonna get them mm -hmm. off of pink slime, right? right? There's others who are gonna eat meat and beef, all that you can put in front of them. Who's that movable middle? And how do we find the right kind of language to, to, to move them in a way that gets them to agree with us? And I think what we heard today was it, it can't always be about the science or the facts. Um, we have to many times use the same sort of em emotional imagery and, and ways that the activists use. We have to use their own tools, okay? The one thing that the activists do exceptionally well, especially the new activists, um, is they found a way to personalize the story, mm -hmm. right? Especially the experienced survivors. And it used to be um, in the old days, right? We all remember these, that you, know, you only got worried about an activist or an organization if they were coming at you and they had three things, right? Mm -hmm. They had a way to make the story very personal. They were really well funded uh, and they had a really great communications infrastructure that they could mobilize uh, to get people on their side. Well, social media has like... Exactly. Yeah. You're right, it has completely leveled the playing field. Right. So they can make those same... They can make it incredibly personal, especially the, the experienced survivors. Um, they don't need a communications infrastructure. We've provided it for them. Uh, and they don't have to uh, have any sort of funding. I mean, Bettina is a, is a mom, for crying out loud. So uh, I think we have to uh, remember and to separate the messenger from the message and look to the movable middle, the folks that we can sort of attack, not attack, but approach in a way that's gonna get them to see our point of view. Can, can I jump in here with sure. a specific sort of example? Because you go back 10 years ago, uh, as I usually put it, people like me loves crisis because that's where we get our mandate. Then of course I usually follow up by saying that, on the other hand, we don't really have the huge crisis if we're good at what we do. And um, I was hired for my current job, which was I started eight years ago, because of a crisis that had basically created, I mean, we, they owned the media. It was the worst handled crisis I've ever seen. It was pretty funny looking at it from the outside. Of course, then I didn't know I was going to be on the inside handling it afterwards. But 
they, they did not have the direct language at all. And this was about hygiene, not good, and food processing. Yeah. Uh, this was about cleaning. This was hidden cameras. This was reporters getting hired as slaughter workers with hidden cameras in their ties and tent and uh, pens and whatever. So it was all over the plate for um, almost a year. And the statement of everything was, Danish Crown, you wouldn't need it. And we actually already then had the highest food safety standard mm -hmm. worldwide, but you couldn't come back with this. Mm -hmm. But the, I think, let's be honest here, you never really have a thing like that going on if there isn't just a tiny bit about it, if there is just a little bit of fact to the story. And the first thing they asked me when I started working there, the board of representatives, we're talking farmers here, they go like, so how are you going to avoid another scandal like this about the cleaning? And I said, you know what, guys, this is pretty easy. We clean. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, if we actually know for a fact, so I spent a lot of my time sort of, well, not cleaning, but mm -hmm. tidying up the whole mindset. So we, if we actually don't have a problem, then we are pretty safe. That's one thing. The other thing is we have managed to turn that around it today to be known as the highest on food safety, the highest on cleaning, highest on hygiene. And what's more important, the direct speaking has given us a credibility, which means that when we have issues, when, when I go out or somebody else goes out and say, can I just you know, give you the facts? We actually have a platform of credibility that says the reporters yeah. and the media, they will actually say, okay, if you say so, I believe you. This has taken eight years to create. But it can actually be done. You can turn right. around. Yeah, I, th I think the straight talk in the heat of battle looks very defensive. Yep. But in the day of in everyday discourse, yes. right? If you're a straight talking yep. company, then you can fall back on that because yep. that's your that's record. That's what we created. And as that's a the way to do yeah. it. Build it into yeah. the communications yeah. culture all along. So if you're a straight talking company, how do you talk straight about pink slime, Mike? Well, going back to the observation that I made earlier is I think what we really owe to the consumer and to the customer is to be increasingly more transparent. Uh, and I would argue that actually uh, many industries fail mm -hmm. in not being transparent enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is to say that the straight talk, I think, can work in the sense if it's up front and it's identified. But I think the challenge with pink slime is we knew about it inside mm -hmm. the industry. Did we share that with customers? Did we share right, that right. with consumers? Mm -hmm. We did after the fact, after it hit, and then we're playing defense. Mm -hmm. And then it's already exactly. too late. Uh, so I think going forward... Uh, you know, the hope would be is that when you, where you have challenges, you kind of do an inventory mm -hmm. of what those challenges are. You're also doing an inventory of all the NGOs and the activist groups that you're looking at and kind of saying logically, are there some that we can partner with? Are there some that we should at least have dialogue with on a regular basis? And are there some that we need to monitor and see, you know, what might pop up? And I think most of our operations have done that in terms of where we're looking at that. The real challenge, I think, is sometimes uh, Bettina Siegel mm -hmm. pops up when you don't expect it, or with that particular issue, what was interesting is so pink slime was actually coined by a government official, you know, more than 10 years ahead of it becoming an issue. Mm -hmm. And there were other people on television. You had Anthony Bourdain in a story uh, two years prior uh, where he had used the term pink slime. And he was talking about if you really want a good hamburger, you know, get your own prime steak and grind that meat yourself. And then he made a general mm -hmm. reference to the industry and the use of pink slime. And then you had Jamie Oliver uh, mm -hmm. with a room full of school children, and he trotted in this calf and sort of had it painted on the side to say this is where the loin is and this is where the other parts of the meat are. And then he had this big thing of ammonia. And he put this ammonia on top of a washing machine, and he said essentially what happens is that the large companies is that they take you know, sort of the meat that remains and the bone and stuff, and they put it into a centrifuge and they pour all this ammonia on it. And then in the background, you hear these kids go, ooh, yick, you know, and all this. And so it created a sense of, you know, 
what it was all about, but without real science or without really explaining what happens in the process. And yet, and, 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 yet, and it but, still but, didn't but get traction. It still didn't get traction. It got traction when uh, Bettina Siegel, in her blog, The Lunch Tray, uh, linked this up to the school lunch program. And so then there was a level of outrage that didn't exist before, and you had 250... And personal connection. And personal connection. Right. As a mom, she had... So they had 250,000 people signing online this petition to get this out of the school lunch program. Um, it was interesting in the sense that it gets picked up by Huffington Post, and it then gets picked up by ABC News, and it was funny when Diane Sawyer led the story, they, they let it off as if ABC News had done an investigative report. Uh, it was actually kind of appalling, and in fact, Phil Boffey in the New York Times signaled that out. Uh, but I, I come back to, you know, how would you have done that differently? Mm -hmm. Well, we had one major customer uh, that a year ahead of time had actually pulled the product, and they had been willing to pay a premium for that product. What we probably should have done as a company is at that point, that should have been a signal for us to talk to other customers mm -hmm. and make sure that not only the purchasing agent for those companies, uh, but their senior management was full aware of what this product was. So as a consequence, I think a lot of food companies now are thinking about, okay, so what are other things that might have the ick factor, because at the end of the day, what happened with that particular product, and, and at the end of the day, all you're getting is you're getting pure meat out of this process, and you're having trace elements of ammonia for our competitor's product, cit citric acid for our product, and if you, you can't get 90% lean beef without using lean, finely textured beef. So the point is to be able to, again, straight talk, transparency. Mm -hmm. It's hard in this oh, yeah. topic. There's no question oh, yeah. about and, it. And also being but, able to see what you do from the outside. Because mm -hmm. what happens is after a certain period of time, you get to, you, you see what you do from the inside. You, you, you get to think that, oh, it's only a little bit of this. Right. I mean, I used to be the head of president, mm -hmm. head of president and NGO at the mm -hmm. Consumer Council in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And if I'd been in that chair, I would have fought that whole battle because mm -hmm. oh, ammonia in food, no way. Mm -hmm. And that's the sound of it. Right, so of we course. have to keep track of, if I were on the other side looking at this, I mean, actually, the machine uh, deboning process is not legal in Denmark anymore. So mm -hmm. actually, let's they, put the lights up, shall we? So yeah. we can get to a question or two. Sorry, go yeah. ahead, finish your thought, Anne. No, I'm just saying that that what happens often in corporate life is that we lose track of how what we do will be perceived as. And that's, that's when I started. Right. I just started out as a joke when I started saying I'm responsible for reputation management in a company that kills for a living because we kill 22 million pigs a year. We can't really hide it, can we? So let's get it out there. And we have made really a statement out of, and the battle in, inside the company has been fairly large to say if we have a strike, the first place you can see it is on our website. If we have a problem, food safety or otherwise, the first place you'll find right it there. is on our yeah. website. The I mean, everything to do with our company is out there before anybody else, else gets hold. Anyway, you can't call it um, the investigative journalism if we went out with it first. first They'll just exactly. take the, the, the edge of it, totally. So, yeah. so we have a few more minutes, and um, I, I think that this, this idea of transparency, we've talked about it a lot over these, these couple of days. What else is out in the audience, questions for our panel that relate to the new activism? Hi. Um, I, I am curious working in this field because science a lot of time backs the f products that we promote, right. but yet we can never get that message out against us activism. Is there a way to bring with technology science more to the forefront and to rationalize the conversation or emotionalize the science piece to it? But science is on our side, so how do we bring that more to the forefront so that science ultimately wins because that's facts and data, not emotion? Yeah, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. And I think actually there's a, uh, uh, there's a market for agencies <laughs> in, in, in this field. And in, and in fact, there are some agencies that literally have hired scientists to be a part of their team 
to try and decode some of this in a way that makes you know, sense to consumers. And I think that that's uh, an appropriate yeah. and, and, and great thing to do. Uh, I also think the onus is on those of us that work in this space to think a little bit better about how we're going to manage this. Um, our CEO, Greg Page, talks about that in a world where nothing can be hidden, you better not have anything to hide. And so what I kind of take away from that is we have a higher responsibility to sort of label things appropriately so that people understand what they're getting. Now, what is interesting in this science versus emotion, yeah. it, sometimes if there's enough of a debate, science actually does win. I mean, we've seen that now with the GO, GMO labeling initiative first in California and more recently in Washington. Uh, the proposal in California was fatally flawed for a number of different reasons. Those flaws got cleaned up and many of us, including myself early on, assumed that that would become law in the state of Washington. Didn't happen. Instead, it lost, I think, 54-46 uh, this November. So uh, I think that there are opportunities to bring to bear understanding. And the onus are those of you in agencies and those of mm -hmm. us in companies to work a lot harder and think about this so that we're not doing it in the midst of a controversy. Exactly. We're right. catching it on the front end. The idea of emotionalizing the science is a fascinating one. Mm -hmm. um, terrific. What else? I can't see. OK. Here comes the mic. Interesting on, about the Washington Initiative. I happen to be from Washington. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that prior to the big campaign, it was 70% yes in favor of GMO labeling and 30% no. Mm -hmm. But of course, <clears throat> the companies that had an issue put up a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, they spent more than 30 or $40 million in Washington State pro and against. And it looks like money bought the victory. Is that what it's going to take to sort of take the emotion out of the agenda? Well, what I would, I would suggest is I would look at the major newspapers in the state of Washington and say, what did they do editorially? Um, they all opposed the measure. Um, they looked at the reason and the rationale. Uh, that didn't require dollars. Uh, but I think that there's a reason why the industry... Uh, tried to fight it, and the reason they tried to fight it is because it would cost them a great deal in order to put the labeling on the package. Right now, the food labels that we use today are used for two primary reasons. One, because there is a risk, or two, there's a nutritional element. In the case of GMOs, there's neither. So you're introducing another rationale uh, which is unsubstantiated fear into the mix. And there's already a label that exists, namely the label organic. Right. Yeah, right. I, I'll just, yeah mm -hmm. jump in there because GMO has, which is, uh, we talked mm -hmm. about it yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that GMO became a huge issue in Denmark and in most of Europe back in the late 90s, actually 96 for the first time. And I was back then very surprised because I was a reporter back then and I was writing about it. Um, in a fairly critical sense, let's put it that way. Um, I used to very much be on the other side of the table uh, when it terms to, in terms of food politics. And I was very surprised back then that GMO was not an issue at all in the U.S. It's like, yeah, it's there, what, so what? But I would say still having the opinion that we should label as much as possible. Give the consumers the, the real choice. Mm -hmm. But... It is very interesting because if we start labeling this, we start labeling on religion and, emo and emotions, basically. Right. We've had the debate this summer extreme in Denmark. Do we label the meat when it's halal slaughtered? Now, the halal slaughtering we do in Denmark is extremely, totally similar. We're not talking, talking kosher slaughtering. Extremely similar to um, the normal slaughtering, except for there is a Muslim guy present. Now, the thing is, he's also present all the other days because he actually works at the slaughter facility. And I don't know whether he's mumbling by himself the other days or he's only mumbling the days that we do the halal. I mean, this is, this is it. 
and I'm not, I'm not scared of eating. There's no food safety, no animal welfare issues here. But there was a media storm going on for months saying we should label it because some people had a problem with eating food that people that had another religion also would be eating. We're, we're on to the same thing here. Should we label on, these, on this basis, which is difficult? I mean, the nutritional, the, the risk, the um, giving people a choice, how far we're taking it and how much more will it cost? Because then the minute you put a label on it, there has to be a, a control. There has to be a validation of it. There has to be so it will cost more. And let me just say that we listened to the consumer voices back 10 years ago. And 70% of the Danish people said, we want GMO free. Uh, well, we already have the labeling actually on GMO products. But when it comes, it comes to meat, if the animal have had soybean that has been genetically modified, we want that label as well. Now, we're talking about a product that does not contain GMO as such. Right. But it's the we want that label. They said that, and we'll pay more, and we're willing, and this is it. We listened. Because we're owned by the farmers, we were able to go out and say, we want you to produce GMO-free pigs. We will label it. We will control it. We'll take it all the way. It went to the, into the supermarket at a very small extra cost. Not a single consumer were buying it. If you listen to the, the amount of consumer that buys organic food, wow, it's a seller. Now, we're the largest organic slaughter facility in Europe. It comes up to less than 4% of the Danish population who buys it. Looking at the surveys, it's about 70. So that you have to say, that's another part of the activism. Absolutely. When activism gets going, you do the surveys, and, and you cannot base your, pro your production on that kind of... Right. You know, right. Ultimately, Absolutely. it comes back to consumer behavior, and mm. so what you'd like to think is that you're going to label in order to address that need in the marketplace. You're not going to require it of everyone in the marketplace. And overall, the balance between behavior and demand is uh, going to be something that all of us continue to grapple with yeah. as we continue to mm -hmm. see what happens with the new activism. And with that, I would like to thank our panel, Mike. And Scott, thank you all thank you. very much. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you.